Hello everyone and welcome to this series of videos on the history of paleontology. And I thought we would start the series of videos with tales of fossils and folklore. This is largely looking at how humans and fossils have interacted both in historical time and before that point with fossils within a non-scientific framework. It's also um, very Northern European in its focus and that largely reflects what I could find in the literature. I think it's an obvious point to make that as long as humans have been around and had culture, they have probably reacted or interacted, I should say, sorry, with fossils or that are found wherever they are living. However, when it came to reading about this, to construct this lecture, I very much found a focus, I think because of um, history of science uh, narratives, on the situation, the picture in Northern Europe. So it's with that apology that I continue and I wanted to make you all aware of this. So the key question that we can start with is how did humans and fossils interact before we had this scientific framework? Well, we know that human interactions with fossils run deep. Trilobites, for example, as shown on the uh, left-hand side here, were collected and drilled for use as uh, pendants, so um, hanging around, for example, at the neck, um, by early European humans in the late Paleolithic age. So that's somewhere between 50,000 and 10,000 years ago. These were definitely, within that context, these were decorative items. We know also that shells or teeth of extinct animals are sometimes found as grave goods in Bronze Age human burial sites. So that's a tiny bit more recent. Uh, an example of this is shown in a very much idealised Victorian reconstruction of a tumulus. That's a, a grave on the right hand side here, um, which is from the um, northeast of the UK. So it's obvious from these interactions that we knew we know that fossils, um, as well as being uh, rocks, were also viewed as symbolic um, structures, and they were of cultural significance to early humans. Another really intriguing and surprisingly persistent relationship between humans and fossils is the use of paleontological artefacts as medicines. Examples of this um, stretch recorded history, and they include um, echinoid spines, which are shown on the far left-hand side of this slide here, which were known as Lapides judaceae, and were used um, either in a powdered form, or they were sucked whole, and taken to treat kidney conditions, including bladder stones. I guess that's not really a kidney condition, because it is a bladder condition, but nevertheless, for those kind of ailments, people use these structures as a form of medicine. Fossilised fish teeth, um, usually from the Jurassic period, so that's about 200 to 146 million years ago, uh, used to be called toadstones, as represented in this wonderful woodcut here. There's an example of some of these on an actual fish in this photograph here. So these structures were called toadstones, and they were used to treat many diseases um, in recorded history, and they were also used as an antivenom, so that's really interesting. Amber has been used to counter ailments including gonorrhea, mental illness, vertigo, and the plague um, for quite a long time. So this wonderful picture image here are instruments that are used for distilling amber, um, and indeed, on the right-hand side here, I've shown you some historical reconstructions of a lynx, because for a very long time, it's thought that amber, which we now know is fossilised tree resin, um, was actually um, solidified lynx urine. So that's lots of surprising, I think, ways that humans have interacted with fossils that uh, in, in a kind of a pattern that has continued all of the way up to the 18th century. So humans have viewed paleontological artefacts as potential medicines until really surprisingly recently. And throughout recorded history, and obviously before that point, we think that humans have used folklore as a mechanism, as a way of explaining fossils. So famous examples of these include St Hilda, this is a statue of St. Hilda on the left-hand side here. And this is a, a Christian saint associated with the town of Whitby in the north of the UK. She, her, one of her big miracles is that she is thought to have turned lots and lots of snakes um, into stone. As such, Ammonites were frequently interpreted 
to be a coiled snakes. So when these were found in the rocks around Whitby, people called them snake stones. And the only problem with this explanation was that typically these structures, these ammonites, as we now know, these are fossils of a, um, a, a group of mollusks called the cephalopods. But back then, we didn't know that, and these were called snake stones, and they didn't have heads. And so what the local craftspeople tended to do is carve a head onto the fossil to fit in with that folklore-based explanation of how these structures in the rock may have formed. So the, the full story of that is that St Hilda turned snakes into stone in Whitby in order to clear the ground for a new convent. Okay. Other explanations that have held sway in the UK are that um, the Jurassic oyster grub by fear, shown uh, in, inside lateral view here. Um, this is particularly abundant in the old ironstone quarries around Scunthorpe in the UK. And this was known in folklore as the devil's toenail on account of the supposed similarity in shape to the imagined talon-like toenail of the mythical devil. Uh, some other examples are for, known from slightly further afield. So, for example, on the island of Malta, the ambulacral areas of the fossil echinoderms, you can see an example of a fossil echinoderm here on the right, and these um, structures, these five um, rows of dots that you can see here, 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 and here, these um, were explained as the five-toed footprints of the devil. So this handsome chap or chapess here. And that was used as an explanation for what these structures may be. These were not echinoderms, these were the footprints of the devil. These are just examples, and there are any number of such examples in local cultures globally. These were just a few of the ones that I've chosen to, um, to describe in this particular lecture. So for much of human history, we can say that, okay, when it came to explaining what fossils were, we did so within a folklore-based uh, framework, and we used folklore tales to explain the structures that we found in rocks. And so that's the end of my examples of kind of humans and interactions with fossils outside of science. There's probably a whole lot more stuff that is out there that you can read about in this area, and I'm sure many people have done PhDs on this topic. It's really interesting. And I'm sorry that I have to move on at that point. But before I do so, after this, we're moving into historical territory. We're moving into the kind of the area where we start having historical records of how humans and fossils interacted. And this brings up the question of how we should tell history, right? I'm not, by training, a historian of science. Um, and indeed, if I were, I would probably give a very different lecture to the one, or series of videos, I should say, to the one that I'm about to give you now. But I just wanted to highlight that this is the case, that we have this idea that's called Whig history. Uh, Whiggish, Whiggism is the kind of the phrase that people often use to describe a particular way of telling history that scientists like me are, are particularly prone to. So Whig history is this um, way of telling history that's named after the Whigs. This was for a long time the UK's uh, second political party. Um, these were this group of people, this political party, they were advocates of the power of Parliament, for example, that's one of the things they care about, and they were quite a strong force in the move towards the abolition of the slave trade. So that's some of what they were like um, as politicians. But they also had this habit um, of kind of skewing history um, to the way they wanted it to be told. So Whig historians evolved a way of writing about British history that situated the Whigs, members of their party, parts of, of this party, in the position of the good guys in British history whenever they possibly could do. And it's in uh, those terms that it's worth considering the story that I'm about to tell you in the rest of the videos um, that you'll see below this point on the website. In the history of science, Whiggism is a consideration. It's the idea that the only important developments are those which led us to where we are now. And it's a view in which we look at the history of science only from the viewpoint 
of what we now know now. So it's kind of a very goal-directed and very hero-based uh, narrative of where we got to today. It tends to ignore all of the blind alleys that we took to try and explain science, like some of the ones including folklore that I've told you just now. In the rest of these videos, I'm gonna be ignoring those, and that's actually not how we should tell history. If you want to learn more about the biases that this may be introducing, and indeed um, the, the considerations about um, how we tell history, this paper that I've put on the slide here um, is a really good place to start. This cartoon is actually a really good example of what the, the Whigs um, did and how they viewed their position in history from back when they were still an active party. So I kind of um, wanted to put that in as an apology that because this lecture is limited in scope, I can't spend um, this website and these videos talking to you for hours about the, the history of science. In order to make it serve the function that I want it to do, um, it will be a little wiggish, and I apologize for that. There is lots of cool stuff outside the history I'm about to tell you that occurred and is equally deserving of being included. But because I had to choose some things and not others to include, be aware that there, that there is that bias there. So with that, I will see you in video number two, uh, probably very shortly.